Jupiter Broadcasting presents this program in stereo. This episode brought to you in part by GoDaddy.com. This week on the Linux Action Show. Last week, we played games on Linux. This week, it's time to get some work done. Find out how some of the busiest guys on the internet managed to get it all done using Linux. Plus, find out why Motorola might be Android's next big threat. And Cisco plans to help protect Linux. All this week on the Linux Action Show. And welcome to season 18, episode 2 of the Linux Action Show. It's like season episode 172? Yeah. 172. That doesn't, that's not even an exaggeration. Awesome. Linux Action <laughs> Show, Brian. That guy's Chris. Hey, Brian. Raspberry Pi runs Linux. This is actually a really cool little $25 USB HDMI enabled Linux device. Now, $25 to start. Yeah. The the plan for this is kind of like the one laptop per child project where they like, you know what, we're going to try and hit like a hundred ish dollars, but we want to get it down to like yep. 75 bucks. These Raspberry Pi guys are talking about how they want to get it down like below $25. Yeah. They're, they they want to have a little, little breadboard device that literally has HDMI on one end and USB on the other. And what you can build on top of that is a Linux system. It's, it's specifically with hardware designed yeah. in mind to run Linux. But imagine this, imagine your future media center is just this little stick hanging out the back of your uh, computer's so HDMI port. So rad. That's your entire media center right there, right? Just, just shove it into the back of your TV. Yeah, that's so... So uh, cool. We have a, if you're watching the video version, they have a coin next to it that kind of shows you the size. But this thing's... I don't know. It's pretty neat. It's... Uh, Though, to be fair, the coin... I don't know, go back Here up. They have it running. I don't know what the heck desktop. kind of coin that is. Yeah, so as far as funky. I know, that coin could be the size of a buffalo. We don't know. Yeah, it's that's impossible true. to tell. It is impossible to tell. It looks pretty fancy, actually. <laughs> it does. I wish my coins looked that cool. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, this is here totally is, here's rad. Here's a shot of it running on a, uh, on a Linux box. Super tiny. And even, even Look at that. And it's not that big thing, either. It's that little, tiny, itty-bitty thing that doesn't even look like it's a thing. Uh, underneath the monitor, for those who are just listening to the show, it literally looks like it's like an extension of a USB cable. Yeah. Like a one-inch long USB cable extension is like the size of it. It's incredible. It is really nice. Neat. So that's totally the Raspberry cool. Pi. I got a, I got a link uh, in the show notes with an interview with the uh, with the originator. I guess the uh, foundation's director. I don't know if he's the originator, but he's the director of the foundation. Interview with him. A Q and A in the show. Would notes. it not be rad to have like a thousand of those stacked as a giant cluster? Yes, I was gonna think. Yes, I was gonna. Totally I mean, say that. I mean, yes. like seriously, like a thousand core little arm based yes. power rig. I know. Oh my god, that was awesome. But I don't want to talk about that anymore. Okay. I want to talk about Danica Patrick yeah. and how much she loves websites and their domain names. You know, it's it's good. It's good fortune that Danica Patrick ended up with the fine folks at GoDaddy.com, Brian. Isn't it though? Because she loves websites. Websites and they host them and let you register them. And they had the smarts to come to us and they said, guys, mm. we would like you to talk about Danica Patrick. Mm -hmm. Also websites yeah. and registering them through well, GoDaddy. Danica sat down with me on Skype uh, the Correct. other Correct. night. I Correct. Mean, I, you know, I think it was Danica. We didn't have video. And uh, she said, you know, GoDaddy.com has Also, got you she covered. sounded like a man. <laughs> yeah. But you know well, what? It was late. That's because it was a hard day of racing, Brian. <laughs> yeah, it's been a rough day. Yeah. But, she, you know, at the end of the day, she's still really enthusiastic about domain names. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and what's really cool is Danica, through Danica's insistence, GoDaddy allows us to save 10% off of your yeah. entire order by yeah. typing in Linux in caps because they want you to shout Linux into the yeah. little text field. Yeah. Or Linux 2.0, which will save you 20% off Linux I like hosting. to use it when I make a brand of domain names, like... Uh, uh, here's a great hat that runs Linux.com. Now, now some people might say that's not social media ready, but I say that's when we're beyond social media. Long URLs are coming back in, and I'm hedging my bets. I'm making an investment now. I call that private media ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's what I think we're gonna. Have, that's the next. We're phase. gonna go back to yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. and of course, we'll if you want to, when you want to be ready for private media, you could always do your hosting on GoDaddy's excellent shared hosting. That's what I do. Code Linux twenty. That's what I do. Save twenty percent. My website. 
running off of there. Dude, and it runs like, great. I think we have eight mirrors for the different awesome. broadcasting content running on those bad boys. They run awesome. So thanks to GoDaddy awesome. for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Totally. I have got an Android pick that I am super excited for. Lay it on now, me. you know for Star Trek Online, Brian, I am a member of the Jupiter Force. That's the fleet we created for the game. That goes around our show, Stoked. Which, by the way, is a great name for like a guild, Dude, Jupiter yeah, Force. It is it's just and, awesome. And you know what? It's like it's it's nearing 400 members strong. That's you, rad. You believe that? That's and rad. And anyways, we use Teamspeak to to communicate with each other. And the Teamspeak folks have released a beta client for Android, which means you can get on Teamspeak on the go, which is awesome. That's because way Because you cool. don't always have Teamspeak set up when you're gaming on a machine. Yeah. And it actually works pretty great. So I got a little I got a little demo here, B man. Here's my uh, Samsung a uh, Galaxy Tab Seven. And okay. you see, I got a little bookmark right here, and I, here's the There's information. There's Jupiter Broadcasting, yep. Jupiter Force Server. Yep, there it is. And so now I'm in the lobby, and I can go like down into the social channels, and here's the, here's the uh, 10 forward channel. Doesn't look like there's anybody in there. Oh, but look, there's Spud Boy. Oh, hey there, Spud Boy. And see, I got pushed to talk, which is pretty cool. And so this is kind of like a, it's like a nice little way so I can just put this and leave this running next to my computer while so I'm So literally gaming. when you want to talk you just go, "Oh my gosh." And then it yeah. just it just broadcasts. And of course that. you That's can do great. you can do voice you can do uh, voice to 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 activate too, but it's got a pretty nice little interface on it and uh, it's free, which is nice because the iPhone and iPad version is like 4 bucks. So this being free is really nice. And I'll, uh, I'll be honest, I reviewed that version too, and I'd say the iPod and iPhone version maybe has a, has a nicer UI with better sound quality. But this works. This works. And I mean, I mean, really, come on. The TeamSpeak thing is not about like massively great fidelity and sound. It's right. about just chatting with your friends while you're Oh, boy, look games. at all these people. Hey there, Jupiter Force. You're live on the Linux Action Show. Did I say anything? No? Anybody? Uh, yeah, well, that's pretty, that's pretty enthusiastic, isn't they're it? They're like, uh... Yeah. But look at that big group of them in there. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, guys, go do something with your lives. There you go. So uh, that is uh, TeamSpeak for Android. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really, uh-oh. All right, that gets uh -oh. them talking. Now it keeps running. You're going to have to throw that at the other side of the room just to get it to turn that, off. Brian just wanted to say good morning to you guys. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, yeah, they, they, I think they told you to go to hell. I'm not sure. All right, so uh, now <laughs> what I'm excited about is we're going to be. I don't think they like me right now. We're going to be at Pat. And I'm yes. kind of considering using this as sort of like a group way to walkie-talkie. You can literally walk around and just be like, push a button and we be like, be what's happening, guys? Channel. That's so, such a cool uh, by idea. By the way, if you're going to be at PAX Prime, which is like in a weekend, it's like next week or it's like, I don't know, it's coming up soon. If you're it, be at it's PAX either Prime, a, week from, or a week from now or two weeks from now. Go hit up Jupiter Colony. We have a thread in there where people are meeting up and organizing to get together at PAX. We're going to be down there. Yeah, we're going to be right so. there in downtown Seattle, Washington, rocking out. Yep. It's going to be great. Anyways, B-Man, why don't we switch you over to the Linux pick this week? Uh, all right. Well, with the Linux pick this week, is a relatively straightforward pick. It is one that many people might say, oh, but Brian, oh, but Brian, we already knew about this, oh, but, but it's Brian. so awesome. We have to we have to include it. It's Inkscape. Yeah. Inkscape is rad, and it ties into what we're going to be talking with uh, talking about a little later on in the show today. Inkscape is one hell of an awesome vector design application. I it's totally phenomenal. Agree. It's high quality, and uh, it's it's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And we'll be talking about it a little bit more later in the show. But Inkscape.org, awesome, yep. awesome, you'll, awesome. You'll find out why, why it's Brian's app pick of the week in uh, the second half of the show. You will? Yeah, I think so. Oh! I think it will all will be revealed. Oh, my goodness. All right, B-Man, let's do the news. What's new in the news this week? All right, Brian, our top story on the news docket for this week is a little bit of good news, B-Man. Cisco and Twitter join a Linux patent protection pool. Nice. Yeah, they're coming to the defense of uh, of the Linux. You know what I mean? And this is this is really good considering it seems like there's a lot of people out there that are starting to, to strategically place themselves to go into patent war. And they, a lot of people. Now, this, this this I've got a couple of thoughts based on this. All right. One, great job, guys. Yeah. Both Cisco and Twitter, good on you. You just want a lot of brownie points from Brian. That's good. Second, all right, uh, Cisco, you guys have got to have a crazy amount of patents, so this is a big deal for us. I agree, right? Twitter, you guys have patents? Uh, you guys have not been around that long. No, I think this is more like a total defensive move for Twitter. I think that's what this they, is. They just want to be involved so well, that they have... They like, have a lot of Linux servers. Oh, right, right. So gotcha. They, while they don't have any, probably any real IP. I mean, who knows? We don't know. But while I would assume they don't probably have a great deal of IP to bring to the table, I think it's also very likely that they have a lot to lose if they were ever, ever to be attacked. You know what I mean? I 
You agree? Think so? Yeah, all right. I, well, no, I don't know. I'm like, I just like Twitter. Here, really? Yeah, like, I agree. I like Twitter. I like Twitter. They're fine. Like, I have nothing against Twitter. I just was like, really? Does Twitter does Twitter have like this giant portfolio of desktop oh, and yeah. mobile operating system but related patents might, that come with them? They do have some money now, so they could always throw they could, money they could, towards... Uh, they yeah. could buy up companies Here's or a couple of interesting yeah. uh, facts about this story. Uh, the uh, patent protection pool that they joined is called the Open Innovation Network. The Open Innovation yep. Network was formed in 2005 by IBM, Sony... Uh, Phillips, interestingly enough, and uh, also Dude, Phillips Novell. has a ton of crazy patents and Red Hat's in there as well. Now, the thing about what's interesting about this group is Novell was really one of the founding members. Uh, this group was created to defend Linux from patent trolls and other attacks. During the uh, second quarter of 2011 alone, the Open Innovation Network had 35 new companies join this community of licenses, which is awesome for Linux. Uh, and uh, the uh, while we don't have any direct information from Cisco, the quote from the Open Innovation Network's uh, CEO is they believe that Cisco became a licensee to support Linux, and Linux has apparently become an increasingly relevant to the core business of Cisco. Yeah. And also Attachmate has said that they, they intend to uh, continue as a licensee member of the Open Innovation Network for Novell. Like Attachmate right. doesn't have any plans to make any changes to that arrangement. That's awesome. So that is really good. And the reason why that's really good is because... Some of these patent attacks are coming against Android. And you, we talked about how Microsoft is getting uh, rumored between 5 to $15 per device. Right. Apple is suing HTC. Apple is Ugh. suing Samsung. Yep. Samsung is suing Microsoft. It's like a weird back and forth. With Gives me a headache, dude. Here's, where, here's one I didn't expect to come. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect this one. Either. Motorola has announced that they plan to look into possibility suing other Android manufacturers for violating their IP. Motorola, who whose entire mobile business was saved with the introduction of the droid. Like, literally went from Motorola was going into a financial tailspin. Dude, whatever. The Motorola Razor, that phone's going to stand the <laughs> test of time. That came out in, what, like 1973? And it's going to be yeah, good okay. until, like, at least 2050. Okay, like, that. it's good. The thing is, yeah. it's just such a great design, and it's such it's, it's a powerful feature phone, and it's always going to be great. Okay, and okay. you're going to be able to sell it for, like, 200 bucks forever. You yeah. don't even have to make it one of those free phones. It's funny. Uh, just a quick aside. Uh, I, had a, I had a coworker try to convince me to buy a Razor. Razor when they first came out because they said you should buy it now because these things are only going to get more valuable. These are the peak of technological innovation. Buy it now. They can't. You know make what's funny? I I heard the same sales pitch from someone. Wow. Everyone was like convinced that the Motorola Razor was going to be the end all be all. And then when remember when they came out with like a pink Razor, <laughs> and and everyone was like ooh. Yeah. And I seriously did not get it then. I do no, not get it now. No. Now here's. Here's the thing. Okay. Hey, Motorola. I know, right? Personal message to you. Zoom in on it. All right, go be man. Personal message. This is me loving you guys. That's nice. I've got an idea for you. How about try and make a good damned phone? Then you could do what I like to call make money from sales so you don't have to sue people for stupid, bogus garbage. Here's okay, you what, can zoom out. Here's what Motorola had to say about it. Stupid. They'd say, and see, what they're struggling with is how do you differentiate? I almost don't even care what they have to say. I mean, say I it know. anyway, but I just don't. Like, the that's problem, stupid. The problem they have is how do we make ourselves stand out from the other Android manufacturers? And here's, here's his... Here's, By uh, making a decent phone. How's here, that? For here's what the Motorola CEO had to say. Uh, he said, I would bring up IP as a very important for differentiation among Android vendors. We have a very large IP portfolio, and I think in the long term, as things settle down, you will see a meaningful difference in positions of many different Android players, both in terms of avoidance of royalties and as well as potentially being able to collect royalties. Mm. And that will make a big difference to people who have a very strong IP positions. Now, earlier in the interview, he goes on to mention about how strong of an IP position ha a Motorola has because of how old they are and how long they've been around yeah. and how much innovation they've done in the history. and that they They've have, done a lot of stuff. He goes to say that they have one of the strongest IP portfolios in, in this mobile uh, space. They probably space, do. And that they really feel that it'll go on to be able to differentiate themselves. And then this here saying they're going to start collecting royalties, I mean... You're going to have these guys start feeding on each other. This is ridiculous. Differ okay, to start with, he never says how they're going to differentiate themselves other than the fact that they have patents where they can sue people. That's what he's saying, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's saying we're going to differentiate ourselves well, no, from our competitors really because we can sue them better. He's down the road to those companies to avoid getting sued. What The key word here is he says uh, royalty avo avoidance of royalties. What he means is using our legislative abuse power – we're going to essentially block them from using our IP so that we're the only ones that can use this They can stuff. do certain things. And so these other vendors, just to avoid having to pay royalties, are just not even going to be able to implement those features. 
do and, shit. And their their argument is, well, we innovated on those features, and so we should get exclusive rights. And you know what, Motorola, he, the reason this upsets me is because we've given on the show over the last five plus years mm -hmm. a fair bit of love to Motorola mm -hmm. because there have been a couple of times where they've really embraced Linux. They've said, you know what, yeah. we want it, we want we want our feature phones running embedded versions yeah. of Linux. Yeah. We've yeah. talked about them on the phones. We've even recommended some of their things on the show, and it pisses me off that they're taking not just an anti-open stance, but just a real jerk stance yeah. towards competition in general. It's basically not just an anti-freedom, anti-open stance. It's also an anti-capitalism well, stance, and, and that's take, annoying as hell well, to let's me. Take the, let's take a look at this from the open source angle. I think a lot of times these patents that they're suing each other over are generally closed up proprietary technology that's being injected into these open platforms to begin with. That's right. Not even, that's not even, that conversation isn't that's even true. being brought to the table. That's true. That's very, so very true. As consumers, we're getting the double bone here. I don't like the double bone. No, and in fact, speaking of... I'm not even that big of a fan of the single bone. I'll tell and you... And when they give me the double bone, I get really upset. And please, can I, can I make a request, Chris? Yeah, yeah. Do not immediately switch to the story that's going to piss me I, off the I, most. I'm Do sorry, not... man. I'm sorry, but it, Chris, it feeds into this, man. I, I got... I'm Dude, a little worked up right I now. I know. You got to take I that need... Stephen Elop character, and you got to focus this next story on him, because Nokia oh, no. is not here to save the day in this Android catastrophe. The Nokia N9... <laughs> The Nokia, the Nokia N9 is not coming to America, and or huge portions of Europe. Huge portions of, of most the UK. of it. Yes, I know. This is unbelievable. Hugely unbelievable. So no wonder this platform will never succeed if you don't sell any of it. Now it is going to places like Switzerland and Austria. And oh my gosh, world domination! There you go, Austria. I know. I love you guys. Austria's way cool. I like the sound of music as much as the next guy. Chris loves <laughs> the sound of so music. Angry. I like I like Mike Iron Fist. I'm going to kill. Seriously, <laughs> kill it with fire. <laughs> Seriously, they took something that could have been I know. amazing. I know. I know. Not just a good phone, but the beginning of something great. An really open great. Linux based mobile a platform. Really open one. And we're not talking Google Android open where it's not really open. We just get a little bit of the source whenever mm -hmm. Google wants to give it to us, but they don't have to. We're talking an open platform being developed by a wide variety of companies and communities, mm -hmm. developed by us. Mm -hmm. Motivated by us, mm -hmm. and, and they're destroying and, it as and fast as they can. And a community that is healthy, it's vibrant, it's ready to go, is just waiting for the gasoline to be poured on the fire. I mean, look how many people are still out there working on Memo, how many people are working on Mego applications, and yeah. there isn't even a shipping phone that the consumers can buy yet. I still love the bejesus out of my Nokia N900 running uh, running Mamo. It's an amazing device. It is probably the most open, powerful device on the market today, yeah. and it's not on the market today. <laughs> And so, what, what do we have? In the future, we have a Amigo device. We have the N9 or the N950. That was our hope. That was what Nokia said was <sighs> going to happen repeatedly. They promised it over and over and over again. We, they have a strong, large community. Even if just, the only people that buy it is just us. Yep, if it's just, just developers, hell, even. if the Linux Action Show audience buys it, it'll be profitable. If they could just make it available. Just make it available. Don't don't go through the carry carrier mess that you have to go through, and m maybe it's the carriers. Maybe it's just the difficulty of getting a phone on the market with carriers. Dude, no, because the the like the N nine hundred was just an unlocked phone anyway. I know, but look how well that's doing. And my point is, maybe they've been burned a few times, and now they're just giving up. And they're only willing to like work with the carriers on their uh, phones. It's Mr. Pohl just yeah. wants only Windows Phone Seven that's because he's too. in. He's that's, in with them. That's what I think. And too. it's annoying. Do you want, as do you want hell. me to read what they said? Yeah, no, no, I don't. I I don't want to hear what comes out of their poopy poopy mouths. It's really condescending. All right, let's hear it. You sure? Uh, All right. Is it gonna make me upset a little bit? After the very positive reception to the launch of the Nokia N9, the product is now being rolled out in countries around the world. At this time, we will not be making it available in the U.S. Nokia takes a market-by-market -market approach to product rollout, and each country makes its own decisions about which products to introduce from those available. Decisions are based on an assessment of existing and upcoming products. Mm -hmm. The makeup of Nokia's extensive product portfolio. <laughs> uh, and the best way in which to address local market opportunities. Laugh. So what they're saying right here is this killer, this kill, killer final sentence for me is this one. Decisions are based on an assessment of existing and upcoming products that make up Nokia's extensive product portfolio. Decisions are based on an assessment of upcoming products. So it's Windows Phone that killed it.
It's Windows Phone that killed it. Yep. No, it's Stephen Pohl that killed it. <sighs> and and what and Dude. and what it is is like if there's consumers and a community out there that's ready to buy this open platform, and we're just not even being we're not even given the option. We don't have the chance. We don't have the, the only hardware they want to sell is Windows hardware. I well, you know, congratulations, Nokia. You're just going to become another budget manufacturer. A budget manufacturer. That, that's Where's exactly your my distinction thought. now? There's nothing special about you. You know what their dis- you know what they think their distinction is going to be on Windows Seven. They think their distinction is going to be the OV Store and OV Maps and all of that other Nokia crap that nobody wants to use anyways. And it's the thing. It, it is it is the 1990s approach where it's like E World and it's CompuServe. It's like here's your and world no one's going to care. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to care. The web. We want the internet. And the Nokia platform is just going to be like this little toy. So so really, what they had was and let's let's be honest. Stupid. Let's be totally honest. Windows Phone Seven is not a bad platform. It's not no, bad. It's the not prob- what we want. Though. The problem is, yeah, it's not what we want. And it is Nokia saying we're going to go from having Windows Phone Seven and Mego. And yeah. Symbian, yeah. three viable platforms yeah, right. with totally different markets and niches to just one, yeah. just Windows Phone yeah. 7. So if Windows Phone 7 doesn't do that well or has some problems, right. Nokia as a company goes away entirely. Now, Instead see, of just they have to refocus on some of the phones that they're making and not other ones. Acid Punk it's in the, stupid. Acid Punk in the chat room says that I'm basically taking the way Apple works, applying to Nokia and saying it's not going to work, and that's bad logic. But the difference is, is that Apple was, for, well, was, was first to market and had the ability to build up this massive user base. Second of all, Apple doesn't have Apple Maps and Apple Book and Apple. It's Google Maps. It's when you do a search, you do a search on the web. You don't use Ovi Search. No. You don't use the, you know, so what it's, it's a whole different approach. Also, it is a different approach. Also, the Apple yeah. approach, the, like, the, the music end and the iTunes integration existed before the phone Right. Platform. They made sure they were dominant in a sector that they could use as kind of right. like a, their foot in the door. Right. There's no yeah. incentive to become a part of the Nokia economy. No, There's because no incentive. Nokia at this point has a track record for if you join up with this, we will kill it within three yeah. months. Within I mean, three months, what, we will take whatever investment you have, what monetary happens, your time, and we will kill it. What happens when they don't sell any phones just like every other single Windows phone manufacturer isn't selling phones? They're going to probably bail on the deal, and then the people that bought in are just left screwed with one or two generations totally of Totally screwed. Devices. And here's the thing. They'll have, they'll have, uh, we might. We might at that point see an N9 or an N950 in the Americas or in mo- the rest of Europe or in the UK or something. Man. Uh, but likelihood is, no. The likelihood is all we'll see is an updated revamp yep. of $10 Symbian phones, yep. and that will be what Nokia are, is uh, forever. That are underpowered. And that will be struggling with an operating system that isn't. Uh, it, uh, it's just. It's a lose lose situation for them. They're they're, they're riding well, on here's, a dead platform. Well, here's the great news. Uh, if you plan to go into the ground like this, it's a great way to avoid having to pay pay royalties to Motorola. That's true. Yeah. So true. way to go, Stephen Elop, yeah. for planning ahead, not having to pay Motorola royalties because you're so damn successful. Just don't be successful. No royalties have to be paid. Hey, good problem solving skills. Fan freaking tastic. All right, now let's talk about the Linux desktop a little bit. And Brian, like we often like to this do, this better be good news. This is the future because I am tired of bad news. I want give me the best news you've ever had. You know what? One of my favorite things about the fact that we're about we're over five years old now is that I look back like on you know during the live stream on Mondays it's like all the old classes. Linux action show during the day. Yeah. And uh, those are fun to watch. Yeah. So if people want to tune into jblive.tv on Mondays, it's old Linux action show rolling all day. Yeah. And one of the funnest things to do when you watch that is when we talk about stuff that was in the super early stages that is now like everyday technology we use in Linux. Isn't that great? And so Wayland's kind of getting to that phase. And you remember last Sunday we covered that Aaron Saigo was going to be talking about the future of the KDE platform that Sunday night. Yep. So a little bit of details have come out that I, I thought were interesting. One of them is KDE's plans for Wayland in, in 2012, which we kind of conjectured might come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I love the approach KDE is taking here. So they're, they're looking at Wayland, and, and while the argument about the usefulness of Wayland I think is still a valid one, the more I think about it, there are aspects of X11 that I do like. But Yeah, X11 is great. It's treated us well. One of the things that one of the takeaways that I got uh, from this uh, from the summit that they had was they're taking a very serious "don't break the desktop" approach with the new KDE stuff they want to work on, which I think is really good. In fact, they even referred to it as a "don't repeat the pulse audio mistake," right? Which I think is awesome. Uh, So they want to start building Wayland support over. They think the Wayland project still has quite a bit of time. You know, tons of drivers still need to be done. A lot of software that that kind of 
They're, Depends on X. They're totally right. W- w- Wayland is awesome, and it's improving rapidly, but there's so much to be done. They, so they have like a real logical approach where, they, where they're kind of factoring in where the drivers are going to be at. And so they think real hardcores are going to be probably running some sort of mix of Wayland and KDE at some point in 2011, 2012. <laughs> More like 2012. It's fair, 2012. 2012 will probably be the shakedown period of the early adopters. Yep. Not really meant for general consumer use. And Sounds in 2013, right. they think we're going to be rocking with a KDE and Wayland experience. And that might even be a little QT5 going there. One of the things mm, they have cool. to do is they have to make QT and all of KDE a lot less dependent on the underlying windowing architecture. So uh, part of this is they're going to make KDE even more mobile. And they think, they think some of these improvements will benefit Mego and Android and other platforms to get KDE onto because when you work out the dependencies on X, you now have become you know, considerably more mo- uh, movable to different platforms. Right. So the work to Wayland is also sort of improving KDE in that regard too. So that's a, really positive, uh, that's a really positive improvement, and I really like the methodical, logical approach they're taking to just eventually working into KDE over the next couple of years. That is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll probably be something we'll be talking about yeah, about 2013, but I got a link if, in the show notes if you want to find out all of the cool stuff. 2013, so that'll be, let's see, what season are we at right now? 18? Mm-hmm. So it'll be about season 29 or so? I don't know. I don't know, something like that. That's pretty crazy. That seems ridiculous. That seems like you'd break the world. Yeah. So uh, link in the show notes if you want to read more about that. Okay, that's pretty cool. I like that. That's decent enough news. I yeah. like it. I like it. That doesn't make me angry. I like no, this. this one These are the kind of news I like to hear. Give me another one that doesn't make me angry. All right. So uh, tracking the progress of Ubuntu 11.10, the Orsalot, the Ornic, Orsalot, or whatever the F or, or, yeah, I like how you added R's into there. Yeah. Ornic. Onir, Oniric Ocelot. Whatever. Uh, it, it, 11.10. This is probably hitting the alpha repos as the show. You know what? Let's just call it uh, uh, Ubuntu October. Uh, Ubuntu October. So on the track to Ubuntu October, the alpha repos are probably just getting... The new uh, login manager, it's, it's based on LightDM. Yeah. They're replacing J- I, uh, GDM. I do like LightDM. I've been running it on most of my systems for a while now. I usually just replace it's GDM pretty, and throw LightDM on there as is. It's pretty interesting, right? It's, uh, I guess it even kind of runs in a WebKit environment, so you design the look of the login manager with JavaScript. Yeah, it's and, a lot of JavaScriptiness. Of and it uh, doesn't have any... G- it's, very, it's very GNOME 3 in that yeah, way. Yeah, it's yeah. funny, but it doesn't have any GTK dependencies. And so uh, when, you can, when you factor in Unity 2D mode, which actually runs in Qt, it's very nice. Not to very have nice. to pull in all of GTK, just to have your login manager. So they're, they're introducing this here, and uh, I, I have a link in the show notes about, uh, it actually looks really cool. Uh, it's called LightDM, and mm-hmm. it looks like it's super fast. And so I put a little link in the uh, show notes here if you want to read about it. They have, uh, they have repos out there for a couple of different distros, but it looks like it's pretty much an Ubuntu project, so the main things you're going to find are PPAs for Ubuntu and whatnot. But it's called the most uh, visible, this is the most visible aspect of the display manager is going to be the new login screen area. And uh, we've got a screenshot it here if you're watching the uh, video version. It does look really slick. Doesn't that look slick? You don't like it? No, it's nice. Okay, you look, no, like look kind of like you didn't like it. No, no, no. no. I was just kind of I was looking at the uh, the screenshots that you were looking there at their uh, little funky screenshots. But yeah, no, it's it's great. I like LightDM. Yeah. LightDM is good. Yeah. I mean, it's do- it doesn't really it doesn't really give us anything new. I mean, there's nothing. There's like the, the no GTK the dependency thing. is nice. It's nice, but it doesn't matter because you're still gonna have GTK in there. Yeah. Are you seriously gonna have an Ubuntu no. installation without GTK? No. Are you gonna no. ha- are you even get hell? Are you gonna have a Kubuntu installation without GTK? No, you're gonna have some GTK apps, yeah. so it doesn't matter it really doesn't but it, i still really like light dm it's nice I, th- I like the idea of something that you can sort of visualize and style with some javascript action and whatnot right that's kind of yeah, cool. it's way nice yeah it's way way nice and it's it much uses, more configurable it uses a webkit back end so that's it's groovy yeah that's groovy yeah. i think i think it's also supposed to start up a little faster it's oh. well i do like that yeah because as it is i wait for 27 minutes before my desktop starts up right yeah i know i know we've covered that before. it's already what like 19 seconds who cares hey but it's fun to track the development progress of uh of uh, of ubuntu way cool and way cool. man 2d unity is it's looking, looking pretty good. good i mean i'm still not sold on unity really at all but uh damn that doesn't look that looks like that's full better on. looking better and better and better all the time yeah so i'm loving that yeah that oh. that gives me a lot of hope and i like hope yeah the audacity of it Brian. yeah it's a, it's audacious that hope all right b man well that's all the news for this week
Linux is awesome, and technology is awesome, mm. and reporting on new news and new versions of pieces of software is awesome, but sometimes you eventually have to sit down and actually get some work done. Unfortunately. You have things to do in order to pay the bills or just do good at your hobbies yep. or something. And you know what, B-Man? We happen to be a couple of guys that use Linux to get our jobs done. Do we, we use Linux every day to get our jobs done, so we thought it would be cool to take a look at how we, how we get our jobs done with Linux, what tools we use, what services we use, and how and how Linux Linux is a central part of that. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, I'll let, I'll let you kick it off because you got a couple of cool things to talk about. And uh, well, I, I guess you've, go for you're it. familiar with Redmine. Uh, I love Redmine. I actually hadn't really been too familiar with it until I needed to set it up for a client of mine. And uh, they wanted something that would let them do like project management, kind of like you're familiar, familiar with Microsoft Project. That would let them graph that onto a calendar and get charts of people's availability. Yep. Input issue tracking. And they even do a little bit of software development. So they wanted to tie it in a little bit with some SVN action so they could do version tracking. Yep. And, and this Redmine software does all of that and even like in-web uh, diff views of source files and stuff like that. It's a really powerful tool, and you can use it just for project management all the way down to you can use it as an integrated project management tool to do development tracking and things like that, too. And it turns out it's not that bad to install. If you've, if you've done things like load MySQL and Apache before, you're, you're really going to be pretty comfortable. It's cake. And if you haven't, I've got some really nice tutorials to walk you through how to get this going under a Debian-based system, uh, which is what I'm hosting it on. Now, I will say... Uh, Pretty easy. It's a it's it's a Ruby on Rails app, so you gotta you gotta be okay with that. So I know some people. Oh, against their religion. come on, I, Rails is red. No, man. Somebody said you said, dude, why would you use that? It's a Ruby's app. It's a Ruby on Rails app. Did someone really tell you somebody that? Somebody said that to me. What? And I said, sir, go to hell. Nice. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, high did. five. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah, I have. I'm I lost really, that client. I'm no. totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go to hell, person who pays yeah. my bills. Uh, just I'll just tick off a couple more items because this Rails is, is it's free open source software that can and, really help you get work done. And it's not just open source. It's open source under my favorite version of the GPL, GPL V2. I'm a big yep. GPL V2 fan. You can GPL V3, you and me got words. GPL V2, awesome. Yeah. So there you go. Bros. Uh, the G it's uh, the GPL. It also does news and alerts. <laughs> so if you assign a task to somebody, it sends them out an alert, gives it them does. a description. It's got multi-user setups. You can have it authenticate to an LDAP backend. It's it has really per nice. project wikis, which I love. Yes. Actually, that's super, super handy. Because, I mean, I, I tend to use MediaWiki a lot mm -hmm. for a lot of my document mm -hmm. stuff and collaborative stuff. Mm -hmm. But the problem with MediaWiki is it can get really cumbersome if you have a bunch of different projects going on, especially if you've got multiple clients yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Redmine not a problem. Yeah, it yeah. does it really nicely. Yeah, and you know what? I will tell you, I will skip ahead. Another another trick that I uh, I used is if I don't need all the other stuff that Redmine does is I've implemented TidyWiki a couple of times. And this guy... or mean Tiddly, 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 Tiddly Wiki. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this guy is just a single <laughs> file uh, file based and JavaScript library based wiki. Yeah, there's no there's no database. No, it literally just reads in flat text files and just parses them and displays them. So if you've got if you've got like a million people hitting your server, not a good idea. No, but if you've only got like maybe say a couple a dozen people yeah. of people hitting it, yeah, super easy, yeah. super lightweight, and need, it runs on anything in the world. You just need you just need a web server to put it on, or you know what I've done? Hmm. Put it in my Dropbox. Put it in the public folder. Got a public URL for it, and I've been able to use oh, it on the road. Point to it from the. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. that's a good way to so go. So it's a nice little. It's a nice little Dropbox companion too. Oh, that's so great. If you just need a. If you just need a little bit of wiki, tiddly wiki is the way to go. Nice. You just need a little bit of wiki. You just need just need like a smidge of wiki. The nice thing about Redmine though is wiki. that per project wiki means you keep that documentation so with nice. that project, which is so nice. And really, if you follow the guides I put in the show notes, it's really not that hard to get it going. No. And then it's real nice. Uh, so the other thing I'll use, I'll just go ahead and I'll mention it now. Big part of my workflow is Dropbox. And now people have issues with Dropbox. There's some security issues with Dropbox. Yeah, there are. But, I mean, really, whether you're using Dropbox or Ubuntu One or, or any of those general file sharing, file storage systems, it's the same idea. Mm -hmm. And I, I am looking into replacing it with, a, with uh, I got one, I got one. That is, it goes right along with the whole building your own cloud theme. You can have it sync to the, you can sync to this cloud, or you can have it sync to a local device, and it will set up firewall rules for you using universal plug and play. And then your devices on the road are still syncing all together, but just with a device back at your home. Nice. So I'm going to cover that yeah. in a future episode. But right now I'm using Dropbox, and I, I use Dropbox, and I know B man, you use Dropbox for just about everything conceivable. I do. I put my I put my wiki in there. I put notes in there. I put all kinds of things in there that I need across all my machines. 
VNC connection profiles, uh, Microsoft Remote Desktop RDP profiles, anything I need across machines. I symbolically link config directories in there. I know you do that too. Oh yeah, huge, huge, huge. thing about that is using a, a system, a sync service like this. Is even if you don't sync with another machine, even if you just sync with the cloud, a it's backup, but b when you reload a box, you load that sync client on there, and like eighty percent of your functionality is back. And you get right back to work. And that's a huge part of it. Way nice. Yeah. It's peace of mind. So it's yeah, nice. Yeah, definitely. So Dropbox is a key part of my workflow. The other last little bit that I'll touch on that I use a lot is, uh, is todo.txt. And this is from Gina Trapani. Uh, she does like This Week in Google. She used to do Lifehacker. Yeah. This is a task management application on Android. This is like a bonus Android pick, I guess, that is task <laughs> management via text files that save to your Dropbox. So on, when I'm sitting at my desktop, I still use these same text files. She also has a Linux, nice. a Linux command line version where you can just type stuff in the command line and it just saves to these files. It's the same format that's readable. So you can do it through a text editor. You can do it through this Dropbox client. You can do it through a Linux command line utility. And they're always just in your Dropbox wherever you're at. That's nice. So that's, that's to do.txt touch. That's nice. And you can find that uh, link in the show notes. I like that. Now, B-Man. Yeah. What if I was organizing all this stuff to get a project done, and I had a project that was maybe kind of artsy fart? All right, now, what, before I get into that, I just want to kind of take... I use Dropbox really heavily, too. I do a little bit of a different take on it now. All right. So what I use Dropbox for mostly is my off-site backup. Oh, sure. It's kind of my off-site backup thing. But what I found is I have so many different machines. I'll have all my main desktop and my laptop and all my portable rig and my tablet mm -hmm. over here, and they're all syncing up at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, Dropbox is really great at pulling stuff down. Yeah. It can be really pokey so. at pushing things up to the cloud mm -hmm. sometimes. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and made basically a, a home server that's sitting at home that basically just has a, a nice little secure little FTP. Nice. Opened up. Yep. I use rsync and a couple of other tools to make sure my files get synced over to that. And then I use Dropbox from my home server mm -hmm. up to the cloud nice. to keep it all sorted. That way I still have the ability to say, come here to the studio, yep. log into my Dropbox get account, it. grab some files mm -hmm. and whatnot, put them back up. Those files get updated onto my home server and then get pulled back out to all my machines at home. It's a little more convoluted of a setup, but it gives me a little bit more fast. Now, I know you're going to bring up land syncing. Land syncing, but it's not turned on always by default in all versions of the Linux client. Right. And land syncing really makes a difference on it Dropbox. It makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, but but I still wanted uh, I wanted something even faster, yeah. and I wanted something where I had a little more control. I like and if the, Dropbox goes down, I, like I want to be able to just go right onto my server mm -hmm. and grab it. There's one other bit that, that I need. And that is really quality version control. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah. so I'll, I'll get into that in a second. So the work that I that I do, and we'll we'll talk about uh, doing a, a comic book design right now. So uh, for those of you who have not seen it, was it just this last Wednesday? I think so, man. Jeez, it's been a long I week. I know, right? This last Wednesday, I released my first issue of my first comic burr, book. Burr, burr, burr. Uh, called Roadside and Hank and the Aliens. Now, uh, we released it, or I released it as a PDF and a ZBZ file. It's all free of DRM because I like freedom uh, and, and wonderful things like that. Uh, so that's out there now, and you can buy it, and we're, we're going to be shipping uh, uh, things through Amazon so you can get a physical copy later if you want a physical copy and don't want the digital DRM-free, super awesome, amazingly high-resolution, astounding copy. Uh, but there's there's all sorts of good stuff related to that. You probably want to go to lunduke.com and buy it. That's probably for <laughs> sure. Now, that said. You probably want to do that. You probably want to do that. This in Inkscape. Now I made this in Inkscape, uh, or at least mostly in Inkscape. So all of the graphics, all of the artwork, I sat down and oh, okay, did yeah. in Inkscape. Yeah, yeah. So I sat down uh, on my on my main rig here. My main rig that I did this on was an Ubuntu 10.10 .10 box with Inkscape rocking. Now how this how this works for me as a software developer moving over to the graphics design world, I treated things very much the same. Yeah, I would so think so. I want to have I want to have a highly modular bit of art. So like. If I'm developing a piece of software, like Illumination Software Creator, which you also want to buy from RadicalBreeze.com, if, like if I'm doing that, mm -hmm. I want each individual file of source code right. to be backed up, right. and I want and to revision. store every revision I've ever had just in case I need to revert back. So you're back. Probably, uh, probably using something like Apple's Time Capsule? <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you, you'd, you'd think I was using Apple's you're, Time you're Capsule. Such a great system, it would just Brian. be so obvious, but no. <laughs> so uh, so obvious. depending on my mood of the day, I'm either using SVN or, or uh, Bizarre. Uh, those are my personal source control, uh, version control systems as, as yeah, I have yeah. choice. Yes, yeah. I and I do it all on my homeland. Now there are a lot of really, really, really great services out there. I mean, if you want to use Git, GitHub is great for for yeah, source control. Like if you want to go right? offsite, GitHub there, seems to be huge. 
they're huge and they're reasonably priced, but I have a decent home server with a lot of storage. Yeah. So I went, you know what? I'm going to store it all on my home. I mostly use SVN. The great thing about that is I can get really good integration for both Nautilus and Conquer yes. to, to SVN. Yep. So it makes it really easy for me to browse around and, and look at like all my revisions. So, uh, for, for example, could you bring up, a, bring up the screenshot of, uh, of, uh, of the comic there? Boom. All right, bring up that second screenshot. Uh, scroll down there and bring bring that guy bring that guy up. You can just click on it and we get a nice big. Oh, one all right, all right, cool. Boom! Oh my gosh, that's way too big. Yeah. Scroll out. All right. So uh, so looking at that, just scroll on a little bit. You see that? Uh, so you've got you've got multiple multiple dudes there. Yep. Each individual item I can treat as a, a singular vector graphics right. file. So and it's an asset. That every you can... every single one is an individual asset file. And of course I want every iteration just in case I want to revert back. Right. Just in case I wanna let's say um, well, what if in two issues you've got like you want to use a close I want to use the exact to... same thing. Yeah. Exactly. I want every revision possible. And not just that. Let's say I never want to use that again. There's a there's a shot of an angry alien staring at you and I never want to use that again. But let's say I go to a comic book convention and I want a poster of that shot because everyone loves it. I can just yeah. go back to that revision or in my SPN, grab it out, make it a t-shirt, super yeah. easy. So it's very, very handy to have that much. So it's it's nice, not just for software developers, but for artists, mm -hmm. uh, musicians, and everyone to have a good was, version control I system. Was, I was last night, as I was sort of putting together the final you know, thoughts into my sort of workflow, I was starting to think maybe, you know, right now we use Google Docs as our show notes platform, and I just hate it. I yeah. hate Google, I hate the way it handles the formatting, and uh, honestly, it's just easier to format stuff in a real text editor. And then I started thinking, well, maybe the way to do this is like show no a show notes SVN. Yeah. And then just keep everything in there, and then everybody just checks into the SVN and gets the show notes. Neat, and stuff right? Like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's something I've been considering. But then it's like, how do I, you know, other hosts and things like that? It, 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 it is a it is a bit of a pain. If luckily, if you have a server at home running Linux, it's super easy to set up SVN mm -hmm. or Bazaar. You just hop in, you know, sudo apt get bizarre yeah you're done mm -hmm. i mean literally it takes like a couple of steps to, to to configure it and yes it is a little bit more nerdy and yes it may take you a few hours to get used to it but once you're used to it once you have your file browsers configured for it you're good to go yeah um so i i highly recommend that you know i live and breathe in my in my version control systems for all of my projects including the graphics projects uh now me using inkscape is very very nice because I save everything out as a basically indie's industry standard yeah vector graphics right. basically SVG files mm -hmm. I just spit them out boom they're scalable vector graphics that, that is, I can load anywhere that is pretty sweet I can load them on anything yeah uh, so the the nice thing is let's say for some reason Inkscape can't get the job done now, do you keep which your... is hardly ever but right. I can still load those files up in Adobe Illustrator or whatever running under Wine if I need to be able to do some effect that I just can't get through Inkscape do you keep the SVN repo in your Dropbox so that way your Dropbox is backing up the repo Ab well kind of so what I do is I have I always have my latest and greatest synced up to my Dropbox oh okay so basically I have my trunk checked out so whatever my latest yeah, is, yeah. it gets updated and updates to Dropbox. So, so that way, like almost have like a snapshot on Dropbox. Yeah, exactly. So right now, I could actually go to my Dropbox page and grab any single picture that's or cool. any single asset from the current issue and the issue that's being worked on, uh, and grab it and download it locally here, which is really really handy. Yeah. And what's really great is if I throw anything back up there, let's say I, I throw some files back up, what I have set up is a little script. So any of those files that go up there are flagged as updated but not checked in mm. on my on my local version control ah. system. So then at, when I get back home, I'm prompted like, hey, do you want to go ahead and update these into your repository? That's and I'm cool. like, uh, yeah, I do. You know what I was working on that when I was over at Chris's? Yes, yeah. update those in my there repo. There you go. It's nice and handy. It's it's a lot. Of and, flexibility and that, again doesn't depend on Dropbox. That's any no. sync service. So you could use any that. sync but service. I, I think we both are saying it, once you start using a system like that, it really changes the, your workflow. Exactly. So that's something to definitely look into. It, it's hugely, hugely, hugely yeah. valuable. I can't recommend it enough. Now the downside is make sure you've got a whole hell of a lot of storage, especially if you're doing something heavy like graphics mm. or <laughs> more music work. Um, so my my comic book is black and white. It is black and freaking white. And I tell you what, I have about four gigs of assets at this point wow. in my version control Especially, system. Yeah, and yeah. I'm I'm on issue like I'm so I'm designing a couple months ahead. So I'm on issue number four right now. Uh, issue number one just came out. I'm I'm working on issue number four. And just up to the middle of issue number four, you hit the four gig gigs gig? and gigs and gigs. It's because you're keeping it every revision, crazy. right? So, I'm keeping every revision, yeah. but I can go back and get anything. It's it's a historical thing. Wouldn't it be cool? 
wouldn't it be cool if, let's say, your favorite webcomic, like, let's say Penny Arcade yeah. or, hell, Marvel's Ultimate X Men. Wouldn't it be cool if they kept something like this? Yeah, and you can at I almost any point hope they did, just folks. check into it and go back in time and see what the art was like for the individual. Yeah. I mean, that'd be so cool. Yeah. I, I I know a lot of people do that with their with their media storage programs, but uh, to take it a step further and actually use Virgin Control software, yeah. I think is really cool and really critical. That is nice. now, and you could do that with docs. It doesn't have to be image files. It could be spreadsheets. It could be anything you need to keep iterations of now I actually am using uh, a couple of projects to track my progress mm. now if I've, I'm making a comic book I've got to get things out on time mm. now uh, red mine is really cool mm -hmm. way overkill for what I need probably is huh because red mine can't give overkill. you like here's here's your here's your deadline here's where you're at here's the graphs it can give you all that kind of stuff exactly um, I'm actually using the project management software that comes with KDE and I'm drawing a blank right now of what it's called KDE project there's a uh, there's a there's an application in KDE that gives you a Gantt chart um, is it just called project management I think or K Plateau K Plateau sounds right yeah. That's what I'm seeing. There it is. That's K Plato. K K Plato. Okay. K Plato. I'm using actually that guy uh, to do all my project management about you know what what order I do, do I need to get the graphics right. in, when do I need to get things to uh, uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, to Amazon for review, when do I need to get things done, and this is what I'm doing doing right now for my project That's cool. management this looks really, stuff. It looks like it's it looks like it's exactly what you need. It's not too much. But yeah. it gets you sort of the uh, key individual like milestone points that you can put on a piece of paper. And, Ex exactly. And, and follow. It's really nice. It's really slick. It's really easy. Um, you know, I use it on all my machines. It's a KDE application, but it looks and works great on a GTK-based yeah, desktop it's anyway. Yeah, it's got, uh, yeah, got, got the... Uh, it's got the Gantt charts and everything else. Scheduling, and, uh, scheduling assistant, which looks nice. And it works dandy. I, I really have no issue with it. And then I am using uh, MediaWiki mm -hmm. for my wiki uh, because I'm, I've got a comic book going on. Right, and you want to keep the lore straight. I've got like that, exactly. Right? I've got like so many storylines right. and branches. I don't and want you forgive what happens. Characters to, have said. Don't forget what happens to Stanley. I don't want. I don't you you got to keep track. Dude, there. trust me, Stanley's not going anywhere. All right, okay. Anyway, but uh, so it's so yeah, exactly. You've got to get it. Got to get it together. Uh, you remember when? Uh, now I'm not a big fan of the show Lost. <laughs> but you remember when th they were having a difficulty after about <laughs> season <laughs> season one or two? Well, they did. They they put together a wiki. Oh, okay. Um, so about after about season two of Lost, they realized they'd written themselves into so many yeah. corners. Yeah. They they were having a hard time they keeping everything straight. Go. So what they did was they got a wiki together. They brought in That's some new writers. Hilarious. And they tried to fig get make sure they had everything documented. So that way they didn't screw up too much. Good. Uh, they still screw up a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. but the thing is, it works even for a huge project like. Like that, which oh, my comic book's nowhere near as convoluted as Lost. Well, dude, look Thank at God. Uh, yeah. But but yeah, exactly. Diddly Wiki though, so I it think works is, really well. Diddly Wiki for me is a little more uh, lower powered than Media Wiki. Yeah, which is okay. Well, Tiddly Wiki's not about you know in all the inline editing features and everything right. else. It's right. about taking a, a a couple of files and formatting them properly so you can get at the data. Yeah, yeah. You know, or it, just throw everything in there and mark down. It's a, it's a little bit it's a little bit different. But yeah. it, it anyway. The the point I'm trying to make is um, using Media Wiki or a lot of the Wiki programs or Redmine or Redmine's Wiki works really well even mm -hmm. if you're not in the software industry. Even if you're just writing a book, these are really handy or ways to go. Or even in the show production industry, they're handy tools. So I really think you could take that formula and apply it to whatever kind of work you're trying to do under Linux yeah. and find some pretty successful productivity boosts. I mean, it's been, it's been a big help. And especially Huge. when we jump around, both of us, we jump around from so many varying different types of projects and work that it, they all still though, seem to fit into these workflows. And that's kind of the best way to manage all these different things that are coming at us is they all go into the system. Super, super nice. Yeah. And I just want to make one quick last shout out. I love the GIMP. Oh, right? I love the GIMP. Yeah. Uh, you know, I do almost all of my work in Inkscape. Yeah. But I need everything to be high quality. I mean, really high quality. Go back to my screenshot again. And right. I just want to, and I'm not doing this to, to show how great my, my graphics it? is. All no, right. you got page 25 oh, there. There. There, it is, there now, it is. Go ahead and zoom in. Uh, oh, make sure you click on it real quick so it's zoomed oh, in. Oh, okay. There you go. Whoa, that is, that's high res, B-Man. Now, now scoot over to the right a little bit here. Just look uh, at that. Look at, look at this round circle That here. is a round effing circle, man. This is way the hell downscaled. From what my actual source <laughs> bitmaps are. So like now the the thing no is, wonder it's four gigs. It's it's well, I like to do things it big is, and nice. This it's is huge. Way the way the hell in, and it's this. smooth as hell. And the way I accomplish that is go through Inkscape, export everything to bitmaps in the crazy high resolution, the highest I could possibly think of That's without making cool. my hard drive explode. Yeah. Hop on over to GIMP. 
uh, apply some filters to scale it. Scale it down. S make sure everything's perfectly smooth, and then scale it to the size I Do want a using the best scaling algorithm that GIMP has to offer, which it has several to offer. And then boom, I get I get some really nice effects out of it, and Dude. it's fantastic. Yeah, that that really does look fantastic. So GIMP and Inkscape, man, really delivering huge tools. Nice, hugely great tools. I I honestly. I don't know if I didn't have GIMP and Inkscape if I could do this comic as like I've done it. Well, think about the I mean, I mean, sure, commercial cost of those tools. Illustrator and Photoshop are great tools, but it's like a thousand bucks though. Like a thousand bucks though, but yeah. So and there's a there's some a link you put in there for Inkscape screencasts. Yes. Oh um, yeah. Now, if you were using any of these graphics design tools, take the time to go through these screencasts. I also, I also dude, put a Get they in help there. so much. Spend like a half hour going through some of these. Oh my lord, it helps a lot. Yeah, they help. Just even, absolutely amazing. They got stuff from color, which is you know the difference between CMYK and RGB, and they've got stuff in yeah. here about filters. Uh, so it, if you if you if you do kind of want to play with Inkscape or just curious even what's powerful, if, yeah, definitely check out the show note links for the video. And cast. if you want to show your work, like if you're a graphics design guy or even just like a, an icon designer or something, and you want to show your your employer what's really possible yeah. in, in purely Linux and open source workstations, show them. This screencasters dot uh, uh, heatherinks dot org. Yeah, it's bad. URL. Uh, it's bad URL, but uh, you know, go go to our show notes. Go to that link. It is amazing what is cap what is possible, and it is, in my opinion, significantly easier than the similar effects performed in Illustrator, which, in my mind, saves you time, saves mm -hmm. you money. It makes it mm -hmm. easier to install whole, your source control, so you have better source element. control and better design tools. Right there. The whole free element is, is a complete removal of a massive barrier where, like, if you're at a corporation or you're an individual and you have to afford that price. Yeah. Or the corporation has to get the approval. That's a huge barrier. And the fact that we have to sit there and either him and haw about that and get, or, and get that done or find just a way to pirate it. it, that also takes time. And when you it remove does. those two things with Inkscape and you just go to immediately just starting to use it, the time you save in trying to acquire the commercial product can be spent learning Inkscape exactly. and get going. Exactly, because I mean, tools like Inkscape and GIMP, and uh, uh, there there are several other great graphic design tools. Those are just the two that I use the most, and those are probably the two biggest ones. Are in every repository of every Linux distro on mm -hmm. the planet, and they run great. Yep, there fantastic. You have uh, so I I have huge recommendations there, uh, and in general, I highly recommend the KDE side of things for a lot of the support tools, um, like the project management yeah. tools and whatnot. And in my mind, they've really nailed that. And of their the SVN clients are generally a little better. At the it. KDE guys, they've done something. Like, like with it's that, like they use their own desktop to make their own project. Exactly. Yeah. They create tools that are powerful enough to get the job done, right. but no more powerful. Like they're <laughs> they're they're just enough, so they work fast. They're easy yeah. to learn. Yeah. Like you can like K Play Doh, you can get up to speed on in like two minutes. It's awesome. Can't recommend it enough. That's that's all I've got to say on Jay -Z that. Jay Z in the chat room says, "Check out my paint," which I have. It is kind of neat. Um, so yeah, so check out todo.txt. That's from Gina Trapani. Awesome. And it's it's a good little Android app, and it uses Dropbox for your task management. Go which check out really Redmine cool. if you haven't. And lots of links in the show notes. I also put links in there for getting it going on CentOS, which would work on Fedora. And I think there's a link in there to get it going on OpenSUSE as well. Good, good, good project. I'm really impressed with it. I've been running it for two weeks now, and I really like it. It was not that hard to get going. So it's really great. There you awesome. have it. Awesome. I think, B Man, I think that's how we get work done under Linux. At least that's how we get work done today. And that brings us to the end of this week's show. Now, I want to take a just a second, and I want to stop here for, for just oh. a minute. I want to look something up here. Bear All with right. me. Uh, Are you teasing about what we got coming there up? Is, there is something coming up that is kind of fun. It's somebody's birthday, Brian. It is somebody's birthday. And it is, in fact, Linux's 20th birthday. Now, there, uh, we've, we've been talking with the Linux Foundation for a little while now, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to do for Linux's 20th birthday. And I want to read you a couple of things here. All right, B-Man. Now... August 25th of 1991 was the time that Linus Torvalds first posted his announcement of yeah. Linux. Yeah, hey, I'm working on this so, project. So that, that's August 25th. So that's coming up here shortly. Ooh. Now, the first public release of Linux, Linux 0.02, right. was on October 5th of 1991. So we got two dates so we're working we with. We got here. two dates we're working with. Uh, the Linux Foundation and the Linux Action Show have decided that we're standardizing on the August 25th as the birthday. I like that. That makes sense because that is the actual birth. The, here was the thought. We actually thought through this. Is when you give birth to a child, that does not mean that every family member met that child that moment. There you go. It may take a few weeks for everyone to meet the kid. There you go. Right? There it makes you go. sense, doesn't yeah. it? Yep. But so when Linux, when Linus announced it, boom, that's the birthday. So, nice. so August 25th. 25th. Okay. Now, that said... 
Uh, so that's like uh, there's that's no, coming up soon. There's no show on August 25th. No. And there's, there is the one on the 21st. And, and Linux Con is going on this next week. Now, so what the Linux fa- Foundation is doing is they're going to be throwing an official 20th birthday bash Absolutely. at Linux Con on August 17th. So if you're at Linux Con and you miss that, you are stupid. Wait, but uh, I'm, I'm going to miss it. Uh, we're not at Linux Con, though. Oh, oh, so if you're at Linux Con, yeah, no, I, I'm not going to be there either. No, okay, yeah, right, yeah I was going to say we're kind of screwed. But if I right. was, you would be and I didn't go to the party. Oh man, stupid! What the hell's the matter with you? I'd be stupid. Ah, I can't All right, even but it. so that's August 17th. They're having a party next Sunday. Whoa. That is August 25th or 21st. 21st, be man. August 21st. So a couple of days early uh, of the uh, August 25th uh, birthday. We're going to be having a Linux action show, Linux 20th birthday extravapalooza. We're going to have an early birthday party right we're having a, show. We're having a full-on birthday party. The entire show is dedicated to the birthday of Linux, the 20th birthday of Linux. Linux is turning 20, Are we going to have cake? What are we going to do? I don't know. Oh. But we can't drink yet because it's not the 21st birthday. Oh, crap. Yeah. That's all I like to do, though. Next year, we can give Linux a beer. Okay. Yeah. Could I have the beer for Linux this year? I mean, yeah, I do can, like to can, drink yeah. an awful lot. Well, though. you know, I, I've seen birthday parties where the dads get pretty sloshed at the yeah, kids' birthday. True. So it's, it works. <laughs> okay. It works pretty okay. Uh, so that's going to be going on. We're going to have some special guests, uh, which we're not announcing yet. But I'm going to say this. They're good special guests. You are going to enjoy listening to and watching them. And you're going to want to tune in. Are they going to be live on Sunday with us? Some of them. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping. I'm hoping all of them. But we'll see. All right. We're, we're still working out okay. the details. The problem is Linux Con's going on. Yeah. And so, so some busy. people are going to be traveling on Sunday. That's the thing. So we're we're still working it out. But yes, we're going to have some cool people yeah. from. And if uh, we can't get anybody from some different from organizations from there on, uh, maybe we'll just call somebody up at Microsoft and talk about Windows Mobile for a bit. That could always be a good way to celebrate the old birthday. It always is. <laughs> it, you never can go wrong with that. Hey, B-Man, I think that's the show, right? Man, I hope so, because I am tiddly pooped. So tune in next week for the live birthday over jblive.tv at 10 a.m. Pacific time. 10 a.m. On Sunday. Linux's 20th damned birthday. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Awesome power. And then the weekend after that, we probably won't be shooting on Sunday because it's going to be PAX weekend. We might need to shoot like on that Thursday or something. Man. So we'll figure, you'll, we'll give an announcement so for you. So much going we'll on. We'll try to remember to make an announcement next week's episode. So much going on. All right, B-Man. Well, uh, I think that just about wraps up this episode of the Linux Action Show. But we'll see you next week. Probably. We don't know. We don't know what's going on right now. I hope we don't miss that one. Man, wouldn't that suck? We would feel stupid. All the news for this week. That's it? Next week, we got to have one that's like, uh, you know, some guy died and left $18 billion to uh, Linux, the Linux kernel or something like that. We need some like crazy good news. Not that, that not that I want some guy to die. I'll work on that. Let's <laughs> <be>. <laughs> that's- <laughs>